So uh, where where were we? Okay, we was up to still in John chapter 10. John chapter 10, and we began roughly around verse 30, I and my father are one. Now, it's very interesting because Christ, Jesus, Jesus actually goes through an actual explanation and a description and in much detail of what his relationship is with his father and our father. So it's very clear when we ask the question about whether whether Jesus Christos is God or Jah, that he is the son of God. And then he points out right here in John 10. In other words, he clearly says that there is a... a um, uh, subordination of his own will even as the son of God to his father so we need to understand that him and the father is one and he's revealing things of the father in other words the gospel is very correct when we go forward to the epistles and the apostles who explain that he, he humbled himself even though he were a son he humbled himself to the role of a messenger to clarify one very important thing, and that is the will and the testimony of his Father, of our Father, and to restore us, to restore the lost sheep of the house of Israel, who many interpret, and I as well hold that that interpretation has much truth, is that that lost sheep or lost sheep of the house of Israel is speaking about the tribe of Judah and the diaspora, of the Ethiopian Hebrews from such a time even to the present time and dispensation because they were scattered in every nation. The word says that because of their disobedience, they were scattered to the corners, the four corners of the world. So what the Messiah, the Moshiach was saying is I'm speaking to you all here, but we have many brothers and sisters in the lost who are scattered in all other nations. Now, as far as the Gentiles, there is a role and a responsibility for the righteous Gentiles. But the main and primary mission of Yehoshua HaMoshiach was to that Judaic, Hebraic, that Ethiopian, Ethiopic, Hebraic, and Judaic root in that region and beyond. And, and beyond that particular region. And speaking to the ethnic, the ethnic was the, the black, in other words, or those who were the Ethiopic, or as um, Titus recalls in, in his uh, histories, that the Israelites he saw were of the Ethiopian race. And this is all historic and recorded, and they use the same um, historical records for Julius Caesar, the Roman Empire, so forth and so on. And in those same records, we find that, that the racial identity of the Hebrews was as black peoples, you know what I'm or called Ethiopian peoples. So that right there should just settle that particular matter. And yes, we have the other Jews, the Council of Jamina, and them coming into Judaism, so forth and so on. But on this particular matter, on this particular matter here, it's important for us to to get a good groundation on the nature, the nature of God and what is the meaning of El, Elohe, Elohim, of Jah, of uh, Yahweh. And we'll put this here as well. Should have put this here from before, but we'll add this to this teaching of this is how you'll find it in the King James Bible and in certain reference sources as Jehovah. This is the anglicized um, version of it. And yes, it's some of the perversion of it from the truth, but in the language of the people who spoke this, this was the best way because it's come from the Germanic. And then the J in Germanic has a different enunciation than the, just like the V also, double V, W, has a different enunciation in the Germanic coming from the old Romantic than it does in this side of the Atlantic. So that's part of, the, part of the confusion is what we call being lost in translation, being lost in translation, that each of these spellings has a particular reference, and it might not be true in the Old Testament or original sense of it, but 
there is not a, a, a need to deceive by the original ones, even the King James when he wrote Jehovah. That wasn't so much to deceive as many people believe, but that was because the limitation of the English language. Just like when we write something for the Ethiopic, we have to ask ourselves, should we force a vowel in here? There's really no vowel in English that's exactly like this. So we, we have to, in a sense, think about the student, and we say, okay, we'll put this here, and then we'll put a note that this is not really it, but this is to help those who are coming from being somewhat linguistically challenged or, or handicapped with the Shemitic, the Afro-Shemitic, the kamo Hamitito Shemitic languages of the East, that where we're from, and the whole language barrier. So when one would ask, is Jesus, is, 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 is Yeshua, is Jesus God, he is the Son of God, and therefore from our perspective to us, at our point, he is that closest light or illumination of the way of God, testifying of the way of God and a part of that family. So, yes, he is of the essence and the essential God, but he is not the highest. His father, our father, the one who raised him from the dead, is his father, our father. He is the God at the highest abstraction of purity, which is kind of beyond beyond where most folks are able. It's a, it's a, it's a high, it's almost a, it's a mystery in a sense. When we talk about God is spirit, what is spirit? People have a whole bunch of different misconceptions of spirit. So the best thing to do is to begin with the testimony and as a child to grow. And as we grow, then we have the opportunity for our bones and the structures to really harden and not become deformed because of the, too much weight you're putting on a misunderstanding. And a lot of people have placed a lot of weight and value on a lot of misunderstanding, going to God and back God and all this. And none of that was coming from the way of Christ. He says, he says that um, you worship what you know not. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, not of the people Jews, but of the Judaic way. And so he's going back to the Hebraic. And here now we can make a full cipher, or at least we hope that this will help us make a full cipher in this particular issue in going right back to the very beginning, where we had pointed to from the beginning of this, but had to, you know, rightly divide the word, hopefully, to explain what is, what all is in it and connected with it. And now we're now at page three of the Schofield Reference Bible, the first book of Moses called Genesis. And when it says in chapter one, the original creation, it says subscription, it says verse one, in the beginning God, G-O-D, capital G, lowercase O-D, created the heaven and the earth. Then it has a one before God. And if you look at the footnote, and we're going to, for those who don't have this and haven't seen this and haven't gone to download it just yet, we want to show you this right here if we can. So you see right here, this is, this is um, see if we get some light on it. Here, we got some light right there. Okay, this is Genesis. Now, if you notice, it has a, it has a one after beginning, in the beginning God, and then it has a footnote. If you can see right there, it got a footnote. And it says, what does it say right there? If you can see it, it says Elohim. It says Elohim, and there's a paragraphical there. As you said, we have the PDF there. Ones can download it, use it on their computer, use it as a study aid and a guide um, towards their studies, and, and um, it's free. So download it or can order a, a physical copy of the book and go to you know, our website for either or or both of those. But here at the footnote, it says one. This is the first footnote, the very first footnote within the Schofield Study or Reference Bible. The very first footnote is on God. And this is why this version of, of the King James Bible, when we heard His Majesty recommend it, how it's actually recommended as a good English version of the Bible, those record, especially even among the 12 tribes and, and others, record His Majesty as saying the Schofield Reference Bible. And it was from some of the early 12 tribes, brethren and others, when I and I was a part of that community 
that told us these things, and I went, and when I found the Schofield Study Bible, I was amazed at the footnotes because I had to go to a lot of different resources. I was curious, like, oh, what does this mean? They don't tell you nothing? And I looked around, looked around, and then in this version of the Bible or this, this study Bible, reference Bible, the footnotes are right there. This is why we say to save time, to redeem the days and the time because the days are evil. This is a good version to study and have as a basic foundational version because the proof of it is right here. It says right here, Elohim. In parentheses, it says sometimes El. It says sometimes El and, or Elah. Elah. Now the Elah, Allah, Elo, so forth and so on. It's, it, they said the English form, quote, God, end quote. The first of the three primary names of deity, the first of three, once again, that trinity of three primary names of deity or divinity, Bamarinya Melakot, of the Melakot. They say is a uni plural noun. It's a uni, it's one noun to describe three aspects that are embedded in that, in that oneness. A uni plural noun formed from L. And they say L here equals strength, strength or power, like the uh, or might, strength or power or might, coming from the ancient Ethiopic, the Hyle or Hyla or Hyle. Now, it goes on to say, or the strong one, or the strong one. Now, a spin of the letters, it says, and Allah, Allah, with an A-L-A-H, not the double L, but similar to, it says, um, to swear, to swear, Allah, Allah, like a Ola, Allah is to swear in the Hebraic, to bind oneself by an oath. So implying by implication that is faithfulness, that we bind ourselves, you understand, by an oath, you understand, and bearing a witness here, O Israel, Shema'a Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Ahad. And as the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, he also being an Ethiopian Hebrew, Hebraic, he didn't have to take his Shema over again, but what he said now in the faithfulness of the Moshia is Ani uh, Amin um, uh, Ki Yehoshua Ha Moshia uh, 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 Ha. He said, he said, he said, Ani, I. And, and, and his, his, now I'm just going to the Hebraic because most of the Hebraic is usually the Greek that's dealt with. He says, Ani Amin, I be a witness. Key that Yeshua. Hamushia or Jesus Christ, um, Bain Ha Elohim Hu. In other words, that Yehoshua Hamushia or Jesus Christ is the Bain son of Elohim Ha Elohim, the true Elohim Hu or Hu Wa. In other words, Hu means He. So literally, He would be saying that I bear witness or am faithful to the fact that. Yeshua, Jesus, Ha Moshia, the Messiah or Christ, um, Bain, son of Ha Elohim, the true God, who? That he is the son of the true God. So the real binding or the bearing of witness. See, this is a bearing of witness that in those days and time when they were still on the apostolic foundation, one would bear witness to because he was already a Hebrew. He didn't have to be a witness to Deuteronomy 6 and 4 already because he was coming from Jerusalem in the high holy days. So, you know, he was already a Hebrew. He was already a member of this community. Now, that's just a link, a connection with the swearing, the binding oneself by an oath and the implication of faithfulness. Now, it says that this uniplurality implied in the name, in the Shem, the Shem, blessed be the Lord God of the Shem, you see, so most po folks think it's a racial kind of a thing. Well, it is racial in the sense of the true seed being the, the perfect black, but it's not racial in the sense that one talk about a Ham, Shem, and Japheth. It's not really. There's a reflection of, of ethnicity and raciality, but 
in, in, Noah was what? Was Noah black or not? So if Noah was black and the one before Noah was black, so that means his, his, his three children, what were they? Were they different colors or something like that? A lot of folks still believe that, but it kind of goes against the scientific logic of it. Um, but it says, this uniplurality implied in the name, but they were different nationalities. See, it's different. If you're going to say they became different nationality, different tribes and people. But the uniplurality implied in the name is directly asserted in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Plurality. Verse 27 is unity. And then to see also Genesis 3 and 22. And it says, thus, the Trinity, the Selase, or Hebraically Shalosha, is latent in Elohim. So the Trinity is implicit in the Elohim. As we said before, uh, Yoel Natan's book on the Jewish Trinity is a the, the cover, you know, the cover is a whitewashed picture. You know, people use it, and, of course, that's what they're used to. But excuse the, the picture on the cover of that particular book, but the contents within, I think if you go on the Google, you'll be able to probably read the whole book on the, on the Google. So um, I'm sure that most who are really interested, even uh, upon reading it, will uh, obtain a copy of it. It's a recommended, a particular recommended book. Um, thus, the Trinity is latent in Elohim as meaning primarily the strong one. It is fitly used in the first chapter of Genesis. Now, we just pause here for a moment because there's, much, there's other references, even I think in Malachi, in Malachi of this particular Schofield Study Bible, because I think it's very crucial for the faithful newcomers, especially from a Gentile misconception in the whitewash world misconception and a lot of these these denominationalism this this fragmentation of the way of Christ you see this page right here this page is in in the book of um as you can see Malachi this is where you go into New Testament the Schofield study Bible you see this chart here this chart here is a very important chart this is another reason why we recommend the Schofield study Bible and we have it for a free download because it's so crucial that everyone, whether they can afford it or have a lot of money or this or that, whatever, they can, they, they can save with their money and get their own hard copies. But at least if they're on the Internet, they can utilize. Or others can find a way to provide others. You know, that's, that's doing good for one another. That's showing love. That's, that's, that's real. You know but here it says it's a summary of the Old Testament revelation of deity. God is revealed in the Old Testament one through his names. See, the real revelation is through his names. Now, what happens in the English when we confront a question like, is Jesus or is Yeshua, Yeshua God or Jah, is the being lost in translation. What's happening is we're getting lost. If, if one doesn't have the keys, one gets lost in translation. Because if we can understand how Christ spoke as well, too, there's certain specific words he used. Like when he says, I am, and all the Jews in, in the, the foolish Jews in, in um, the chapter, we're not saying there's all of them, but, to, you know, we understand what we're talking about. So if you have a controversy, bring it. But the foolish Jews at that time, they were like, you blaspheme. What they mean that he blasphemed? Well, plain and simply, they were saying he blasphemed because he was using a particular expression of I am. You see, a particular expression of I am was the divine name that comes down to us, part of it as Yah or Ehya, Ehya Shara Ehya, I am that I am, which in the, that's the first person way of saying it. The third person saying it about the one who is, is Yahweh Yah. Yahweh Yah. That's part of what's in Yahweh and the true understanding of Yahweh. He is who he is. But when he spoke to Moshe, he said, Eh Yeshara Eh Now Yeshua would say, I am, in a way, some say in the Aramawi or the Aramaic or the Hebraic, that immediately he said, Uh oh, oh, you're saying that you are like the one who spoke in the burning bush. And he said, so it is, because the word of God came to those, you know, and it can't be broken. So that shows that they are gods. You know, you hear a lot of Christians, nominal Christians saying, 
there's only one God. That's the wrong way to say it. For us, there is only one God. There's only one true God. But the Bible even says no matter how many gods or lords there may be, for us, there is only one true. You see, so is, we cannot deny the reality there are gods. You know what I'm saying? And not just talking about the idol gods, but there are the Elohim, the, the powers of creation. You know what I'm saying? That all are part of this divine trinity. So Christ, after the fall, and I don't like to say it like that because people think of a hierarchical order. They're thinking of like a top-down kind of management in a sense, even though there is a structure to it. But Christ is not like down so much, but he is at the right hand side. You know what I'm saying? And, and the God, his father sent him. So he is not God the Father, but he is the Son of God. And by virtue of his essence, he is God. And now in the Spirit and through the Spirit poured out, you know what I'm saying? He is still God, but in the order of things, he is not the Father, you know what I'm saying? But he is the Son who has sent to us who are able to receive his spirit, which the spirit is still a part of that triunity, that trinity. And see, a lot of Christians have had, and you can study this, some of you already know this about the Christian debates and the ecumenical councils and how Christianity got so divided amongst the interpretation of the nature of God and the nature of Christ. But you have to understand this, that although some don't want to deal with those things, for these people who were having these discussions and, and ecumenical councils, it was very important because it, the, one's, one's comprehension is like Christ says, you do err because of the lack of knowledge of the Scripture. And if, if more of those who gathered together knew the Scriptures, but what you had is people coming from their own cultural perspectives and, and interpreting from their own particular ethnicities and former religions now as Christians superimposing on Christianity their own previous a priori priori biases onto it. And this is the reason why the Ethiopic and the Eastern Oriental Church withdrew because the Romanists said, hey, as long as everybody loved Jesus and, you know, did a kind of like powwow in a sense, ignoring what Christ taught while the Eastern Orthodox churches, particularly even the Ethiopian church, were still scriptural societies where they kept faithful to the best of their ability to what Christ was teaching. So when they had a different, what they call, some call monophysitism, we call it more correctly to Wahido, or more correctly be neophysitism, when they withdrew from that, they were persecuted by the Romanists. So we, we really get to understand what was happening. The true Christians were remaining faithful under suffering and persecution, and the false ones were just looking at dumbing down, watering down the teaching of Christ. And this is why we have so many different uh, demon nomination denominations today. And they can't even unite together or speak one clear word on Jesus. It's come down to a love of Jesus but not an obedience to him. See, that's the key. Not just a love of him, but it, or not just obeying what you want or picking and choosing cafeteria Christians, but really accepting the whole thing. Because they accepted it, they would have to change. They would have to do things his way and not Yah's way and not their way. You understand? But they prefer their way and not Yah's way. So, what we feel about what the brother told Tobiah just said, we don't know exactly what he said. Some of the other things that he said were faithful and true to the word. He, he, he preached and ministered it very well. But if he is saying, if what Tobiah and others are saying is that Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, is not God the Father, but is one in essence with the Father, so they are one, but he does not, he, he does not go, 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 above or beyond the Father, you understand? But he is the representative to us in this fallen psychological spiritual state, you understand, of the Father to restore us in that family, then yes, then we agree with that. So it's not denying that he is God. In what sense do you mean God? You understand? In what sense? From this perspective up here is where a lot of ignoramus Gentile Christians approach it. But from this level is where the Hebraic and where even Christ himself understood it. 
You understand? And within this sense, we need to understand the Shem and the Hashem. You understand? We need to understand the link with El and Eli. You understand? And Hayo and Hila. You understand? We need to understand how Hila Eliah. You understand? Is Hila when you look at it from its Ethiopic and from its Hebraic perspective, and then we might be able to understand a little bit more of the revelation of Rastafari and of His Imperial Majesty within these days and times. So we're going to conclude this part because I think we were able to at least refer to areas of the scripture that need to be understood, as well as Christ's testimony in countless places shows that it's about the Father. He came to bear witness to the, to the word of the Father and to demonstrate the word of the Father. And, and my Father is greater than I, but he says, I and my Father are one. Some people can't, I don't know, like something is wrong. They're not obeying, not accepting the truth. They're saying, well, well, he is not one with the Father, he is the Father, and he's saying the Father is greater than me. This would make something of what he was saying illogical. And the only ones who are being illogical is those who don't accept or refuse to accept and deny his particular logic. But much of this has to do with linguistic and, 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 and semantics. You know, the semantics is the shem, the shem antics. People are going romantic and need to go shamantic. That is a whole other teaching that we hope to touch on, but we have to deal with the semantics, you know, saying the word in the context, in the context originally used, because the English, being a, la- a Latin language, a Latin and a Latin language, it, 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 it's not able, it's like reading the Vulgate. If you ever look at the Vulgate, the Romanist Latin Bible, and you read certain things, and then you read the Greek, and then you read the Hebrew, and then you read the Amharic, you find that every other language has, uh, Latin is very, it's, 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 it's weird, it's, it's very, I mean, it's a language, yes, but when you compare it with the pure languages, and, and the original or the older languages, you see that they have to use a bunch of words a lot of times, to explain one word, and then the context of the words is determined by the particular translator. So if you're relying just on the Latin, the Vulgate, and then the latter English Bibles, you're going to get lost spiritually in translation. Now, the Almighty deals with you according to your faith, but if you're really seeking to grow, you really do have to grow and to return to more of the source material, some of it which we have presented right here. And this is another book that, that we published. We talked about it before. Um, this is Ethiopic Grammar by August Dillman. And it's, a, it's more of a high school. This is more like high school level um, studies and materials or even college level studies and material. What we say by saying that, why we're saying that is, is that this is dealing with the linguistics where at least you should have mastered Nababe, the basic house of reading, to be able to identify and recognize. As you see, we use very few Ethiopic or Hebraic letters right here because we didn't want to further confuse those, those who are still on the milk instead of the strong food or the strong meat, the solid food level, because there's an order. You understand, to discipleship, there's an order to study. So we just want to remind ones, the study of the, of the names of God is, is very, very important because they disclose to us the nature, his nature. Even the, when he said, I am that I am, he was disclosing to Moses his nature. But even after disclosing that nature, Moses had to ask, well, um, when, I'm going to say the God of the Hebrews, but... Um, the people are going to ask me, what's, his, what's your name? You know, what name shall I tell them? Because he says, no longer is he, will he just reveal like he revealed to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob as El Shaddai. He used El Shaddai with them. And he did not reveal himself by the Yahweh. You understand? Or Yahweh Yah. The Yahweh Yah, he didn't reveal himself by that name to them at that time. So even the Almighty recognized that he had to wait until the seed, in other words, came to a certain maturity to be able to, to comprehend it. But we live in interesting times now because now there's so much knowledge. As it says, the knowledge is going to and fro. 
And I, I do have faith that those of us who are called faithful and, and true will be able to comprehend, receive, and digest a lot of this that was sealed and hidden from the former generations, from the, from the wise and the prudent that's being revealed right now to I and I as the, um, as the um, babes and sucklings. So my brothers and sisters, um, Shalom Rastafari.